Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Manish. I'm with Databricks. I'm a solution architect. Um, this talk is advanced hyperparameter optimization for deep learning. Um, I will preface this by saying this is not actually Databricks specific. I do take advantage of MLflow, but all the concepts and everything I'm going to talk about should be very extensible to really any environment in which you're working. A um, couple things. How many people, just show of hands, attended uh, the best practices for hyperparameter optimization with MLflow talk yesterday? OK. Uh, separate question. How many people here are familiar with Bayesian optimization for hyperparameter optimization? OK. Um, last thing, and this is more of just for everybody's information, I do like to wander as I speak, and this is a very small stage. There is a non-zero chance I'm going to fall off at some point. Um, I will be OK. <laughs> just give me a minute. Um, all right, let's get started. So hopefully this slide is, is review for most of you. But you know the kind of four approaches um, besides manual tuning, which hopefully none of you are doing, um, that people tend to use, grid search, random search, both suffer from the curse of dimensionality. Um, random search has been proven to an expectation outperform grid search, but you know, it's still pretty expensive. They do have the benefit that because you can calculate all of those points up front, you can run them essentially in one time step. So from a wall clock perspective, great. From an everything else perspective, pretty bad. Um, Population-based algorithms try to take the, the best parts of random search and then do like sort of inferred improvement. Um, they're great if you have lots of different optima. So, for example, if you're trying to build a, tra a trading portfolio and you want multiple strategies, having an, an optimizer that can go out and find like the six or seven best configurations that are some distance apart in the hyperparameter space will actually give you fundamentally different strategies. So you can take those different optima, go deploy them, and you have different trading strategies. Uh, whereas if they're all kind of clustered in the same region, you know, now you have seven models that are all buying Apple, and that doesn't really help you. Um, and then lastly, there's Bayesian optimization, which from a compute perspective is very, very uh, efficient because it is doing explicit predictions on what it wants to try next. Um, the downside is it does require sequential observations. So from a wall clock perspective, it's kind of the, the opposite of grid search, where it doesn't suffer from the curse of dimensionality because it scales linearly, but you can't run everything in one time step. You actually have to run lots of linear things. Um, so some best practices also. Hopefully these were all came up in previous conversations you've had. Tune entire pipelines, not individual models. If you have a support vector machine that you are using to do featureization before it goes into a gradient boosted method or a deep learning model, you know, tune the kernel and the C simultaneously with that second model, or if any ensemble, tune all of the parameters of that ensemble simultaneously, um, not one model at a time. At the end of the day, you don't really care about the performance of any one of those models. You care about the performance of the entire ensemble. Um, use transformations to your advantage. Oh, wrong button. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of how you phrase your parameters, you know, give it some thought. Just trying to use, if you just want to use powers of two, those are not categorical parameters. They're actually uh, integer parameters. It's the range one to five with a time step of one, with a step of one, and then you exponentiate it. Um, and then you can also use transformations to your advantage. So for example, a learning rate, which in deep learning generally behaves logarithmically, um, you know, all the interesting bits are down by zero. Instead of giving it the range zero to one, which it'll eventually figure out, it can actually learn it much faster if you give it like 10 to the 10 to zero, negative 10 to zero, or like negative, negative five to zero, and then raise it to the 10th power so that you're stretching out the interesting part of the parameter space. And then lastly, um, don't restrict yourself just to traditional hyperparameters. You can also optimize for things like what flavor of gradient descent should I use in the first place? You know, a lot of people will just go out there and say that, well, Adam's really popular right now. I'll just use Adam. Um, Adam might not be the best gradient descent for your problem. RMS prop might do better. Ada Delta might do better. So you want to be able to experiment with different flavors of gradient descent. Um, and then even within architecture, in a CNN, 
you know, do you want a kernel size of two by two or three by three or four by four? These are all parameters that you can use a Bayesian optimizer to find the best values for. So to kind of sum up, summarize some of the uh, uh, best practices there, neural networks specifically can benefit from the compute efficiency of Bayesian optimization because the parameter space does tend to explode. You know, something like a, a, a GBT or a GBM, probably got four or five hyperparameters that you really care about. Neural network, after you account for gradient descent, after you account for potentially components of the architecture, you can have nine, 10, 11 hyperparameters. You know, if you want to do something like a grid search or a random search, that's an exponential number of different combinations you'd be trying. With Bayesian optimization, it scales linearly. For those same 10 hyperparameters, you might only have to do 100 to 200 total optimizations. So it's much more efficient. Trainings, much more efficient. Um, optimize more than just the hyperparameters. That does create some cha the challenge, though, that you know, now you have these dependencies. Not every gradient descent has the same hyperparameters. So how do you sort of handle the fact that there are different hyperparameters depending on one of your other hyperparameters, or parameters in that case? Um, and then often when you actually want to take a model out into production, you have competing metrics. If you want to take a, a image classifier and put it behind a real-time API, you don't just care about the accuracy of the model, you also care about how fast the model is able to make an inference. You don't want a user sitting there for two seconds while your model is trying to make a decision if you can give up very little accuracy and get something much faster. But again, you have multiple metrics. So this kind of sets up the agenda of what we're gonna talk about. So to talk about the challenge of sequential training and long training times that goes with Bayesian optimization and deep learning, early termination is, is one of the methods that can address that. Um, for the challenge of parameters that then have dependencies for other, uh, other parameters, we're gonna talk a little bit about conditional spaces and then finally, for trading off between objectives, there's multi-metric optimization. So, how does early termination work? Uh, again, show of hands, how many people have read the hyperband paper? All right, so this in a nutshell is how hyperband works. Um, you select an initial candidate configuration set, you train for some number of epochs, evaluate the performance, preferably the objective metric, not the loss, um, use successive halving to eliminate half, continue the other half, repeat. And what this kind of looks like in, in behavior is, you know, you start, in this case, we started out with eight candidates, train them, take the best performing ones, continue them, take the best performing ones, continue. And in each case, you're also doubling the number of epics in total that you trained for. So in this case, you trained for, you know, let's call it 12.5, then 25, then 50, than 100. Now, there are some assumptions that go with this method, um, especially when you're just sort of doing this naive random search as your initial candidate set, and then successive halving. One of those assumptions is that you have well-behaved learning curves. If your learning curves stagnate, your loss curves stagnate, then you may terminate something that's actually in the end going to perform very well. Um, the other component is that because your initial candidate set was randomly selected, you're really trading performance for just to get something faster. Because you don't actually know how these things would have continued had you trained them all the way through. Um, as you can see here, you know, it's possible that you know, this green and this purple ultimately would have actually converged to a better uh, performance than the purple one, uh, or sorry, this green one ultimately did. But it's also possible this green one would have di diverged completely. Um, so, so there is this expectation that you're gonna have well-behaved learning curves. Um, and, but to give you a, a sort of like a little bit of a walkthrough of how this can actually benefit you, um, let's just walk through a scenario. So let's take ResNet 50 on ImageNet, nine hyperparameters. Um, we're gonna start with about 128 configurations. Uh, you know, like I said, 10 to 20. So in this case, we're just gonna pick, you know, for the sake of round numbers, 128. We're gonna use one P2X large, 90 cents an hour, 12 hours training time. So standard training, you would just do 128 configurations, 12 hours, you know, just simple math. One, 1,500 hours roughly, $1,400 roughly. 
with early termination or hyperband, because now you only run, you start with 128 and then you stop 24, so that you, you've, those are, sorry, uh, continue 64. The 64 that you stopped, you only ran for 5.76 hours. Then the remaining 64 you continue, you stop half of them, six hours, so on and so forth. In the end, you actually use 54 hours of total compute to get to that last best model, or last approximation of a best model. So dramatically cheaper, dramatically faster, dramatically less compute. Maybe not necessarily dramatically faster. If you did everything simultaneously, you'd get the same thing. But, <laughs> um, but you know, and from a compute perspective, far more efficient. So fundamentally, this is what early termination does for you. Now, you can also combine hyperband or early termination with Bayesian optimization. But it works a little bit differently. Um, in this case, you articulate checkpoints. So where hyperband used successive halving and said, I'm going to take my best half and run them for you know, 2x, with Bayesian optimization, what you're actually going to do is run your initial candidates for some number. You might even just, you might even just do equal steps, so 25%, 50%, 75%. And 100%, but you're going to run all your initial candidates to 25%, and then you're actually going to use the surrogate and the acquisition function to go back and choose an entirely new candidate set, and you're going to run those to 50%, and then you're going to go back and choose an entirely new candidate set and run those to 75%. And because the Bayesian optimizer is learning from these cheaper versions of the model, which you ran to fewer epochs, it's making better and better decisions about what are the things that should run for longer. And again, I can go back to the same drawing, but this time it, it, what you can think about it is all of the ones that ran just to this point, we then stopped, selected a new collection of model of candidates to try, ran them to here, stopped, chose, a new, chose two new candidates, stopped, chose this candidate. So it, instead of this sort of like freeze-thaw model that early termination uses, you're actually going back completely reselecting using Bayesian optimization and then just running it longer because you now have a better candidate set. Um, now, I know looking at these pictures and thinking about a little bit that it sounds like that would actually be more, expect, more expensive. Um, that's all on. Ah, so I have these a little bit out of order, sorry. Uh, that, that would be more expensive than, the, than hyperband. But the trick is that random search, which is the, the, primary, the, the sort of initial candidate selector for hyperband, requires far more initial candidates than a Bayesian optimizer does. Um, for these you know, nine hyperparameters, a Bayesian optimizer would really need about 20, um, maybe, uh, maybe 40 initial configurations in that first candidate set, whereas with random search, you'd probably need something more on the order of the 128 that I used in that original walkthrough. Um, so, so in the end, the way it nets out is Bayesian optimization is actually considerably fewer total uh, calculations. The other great thing is that um, instead of just blindly using uh, successive halving, the Bayesian optimizer is using an acquisition function to make a decision about what to try next. So it's making more intelligent decisions. It's not just blindly saying, what's doing well now will continue to do well. Um, and then as well, you know, with, with hyperband, you have to implement your own concept of regret. So that idea that, hey, this model I ended up with, it diverged. How do I go back and repick something that might actually do better? With, with hyperband, you have to sort of implement that idea yourself. With the Bayesian optimizer, because it runs all of the candidates to the same step and then goes back and picks a new set of candidates, it's actually automatically implementing regret in its, uh, what it, from what it learns as it progresses through the checkpoints. And then I want to jump back. Um, one of the other nice things is that with, with the Bayesian approach to hyperband is that it actually doesn't make any assumptions about the learning curves. Because it is adaptive and is a black box optimizer, it will um, automatically account for regret, like I just said. Um, but then it also allows you, because you pick the checkpoints, 
um, and aren't just your, sort of doing like, you know, 1N, 2N, 4N, 8N, um, you can account for stagnation. So if you know that your model tends to stagnate in, in the training loss, you can say, you know what, I'm not going to even bother checking this until halfway through the training, instead of having these predetermined points at which you're supposed to evaluate it. So this drawing should make clear what I think I've kind of been saying all along. The Bayesian version of the optimizer is actually better. Um, so random search is this black one out here. Um, GP-based Bayesian optimization is this red one. Um, the reason that their curves start later is because these have to do a full training before you even get a result. Um, it, their, their sort of loss curves uh, or wall clock time curves start later. Whereas with the early termination implementations, you start getting results much faster because you're training much less, uh, much faster because you're training less, fewer epics or fewer data or something like that. Um, the reason I say date, whoops, I, I really went way ahead of myself. Um, fewer data is there's all this, also this method uh, fabulous and it's conceptually similar in that um, what it does is instead of using epics, as the thing that it varies, it actually uses what percentage of the data set it uses to do the training and then go back and select new candidates. Um, and yes, this actually works. Um, you get you know, a big speed up in when you start actually learning how your model performs. And then in the end, you actually get much better results as well. Um, and in this case, regret is just a formulation of how much did it cost to learn something about how your model performs? So that's why with these um, early termination versus uh, uh, full training methods, regret is a common expression of how did, my, how did I progress through the model training? So a note, any of you who've used Keras or TensorFlow have probably seen that they have early stopping. Um, early stopping is different from early termination. Um, Early stopping evaluates against a predetermined rate of loss um, or the improvement in the rate of loss for a, a single model. It's not looking at the collection of models and saying what's working and what's not working. So what it's really trying to say is like, hey, this model, this, this model configuration is stagnated. There's no, we're not gonna keep training on it. Or it's gonna say like, hey, you've, you've kind of finished. You're just now over training your model by continuing to run it with no real improvement in the loss. Um, so it is not the same thing as early termination. So in summary, hyperband and Bayesian optimization with hyperband attempts to optimize for resource allocation. Um, it will dramatically reduce the amount of compute and wall clock to converge to good configurations. Better implementations include a regret mechanism to recover um, configurations, to recover from configurations that it has progressed but are diverging. And then in expectation, the Bayesian will outperform the random seed. But in principle, hyperband or, the, or this early termination method is compatible with any underlying, opti underlying optimization technique. So you could use a genetic algorithm with hyperband if you, if you wanted to. Um, it's just a question of how are you generating the next candidate set and whether you go back to the beginning or use the freeze-thaw freeze -thaw approach. Um, I'm supposed to wait till the end to ask for questions, but normally this is when I would ask if there are any questions. Uh, so that's, that covers early termination. Um, I'm not showing code for this because there's a lot of different implementations for this and they all do a little, work a little bit differently. Um, but some of the more popular open source libraries out there that, um, or libraries that do this, there is um, HP Bandster, stands for Hyperband on Steroids. Uh, it comes from the same people who um, created the Hyperopt library, uh, University of Freiburg. Um, so they have a pure Hyperband implementation where you can use random search as the seed and it does successive halving. Uh, but what they also have is a um, Hyperopt based uh, approach where it doesn't use the successive halving 
and instead does the, the candidate reselection and continue using budgets instead. And then there is also Fabulous, which, like I said, is not actually an optimizer. It instead um, uses smaller sets of the data to progress through. So you could actually combine Fabulous with Hyperopt or even with HP Panster and sort of do both. I would not recommend it just because now you're, over, you're, you're kind of sampling a little too much on different things. Um, and then there is a commercial product uh, by a company called Sigopt. I used to work there, this is not a pitch, I just happen to know it really well. Um, but they also have an implementation of this uh, that is, is very easy to use. And there's plenty of code, um, if these are things you're interested in trying, that is available on the web. Uh, I don't know if they make these slides available, so for anybody who actually wants to go check out code, go ahead and take a picture. I'll pause here. All right, phones appear to be down. So the next thing I wanna talk about is awkward or conditional spaces. And basically what this means is the range or existence of one hyperparameter is dependent on the value of another hyperparameter. So you can think about this as you wanna optimize your gradient descent algorithm selection. So you know different gradient descents have different hyperparameters. Um, optimizing the topology of a neural network. One of the parameters you might create is how many hidden layers should I have um, in, my, in my neural network? So, and then if you also have, well, how many neurons should be in that hidden layer? The number of neurons in hidden layer, let's say number two, depends on whether or not a second hidden layer exists. So being able to say, hey, don't even worry about this or, or select a value for this, unless this other parameter value is chosen, can make your Bayesian optimizer much more efficient. And just to make this a little more real, you know, this, these are some of the more popular uh, gradient descent algorithms. So RMS prop, Ada Delta, Adagrad, Atom. And you can kind of see that like it's a little bit all over the place, which hyperparameters actually exist or don't exist for a given optimizer. Um, so, so having the ability to say, hey, you know, if my chosen gradient descent is at a grad, then I don't really care about beta one, beta two, um, the K rate, so on and so forth. And the reason this matters is because Bayesian optimizers learn from previous values, it's going to take the optimizer some amount of time to learn all of these parameters that don't matter when they're not part of the selected um, set. And the more of those you have, the longer it will take for it to learn. So by being able to go in and proactively say, hey, these parameters only exist in this case, you can cut the number of total evaluations that you need to get to a converged value. Um, this is more conceptual, so I'm not gonna, I don't really have any code to show on this. Um, it's available in Hyperopt, it's available in HP Banster, and then Sigopt also supports it as well. Um, but it, it's really just sort of like, hopefully intuitive, that when you cut down the set of things something has to learn, it can learn faster. Um, so finally, I wanted to talk about multi-metric optimization. So lots of different applications that you might see in the real world, you're often going to have competing objectives or multiple objectives. So, you know, easy example, fraud detection. You both wanna minimize the amount of fraudulent activity, but you also wanna minimize all the dollars lost. You know, if you minimize the activity, but all the transactions that you allow to go through are like a million dollars each, that's probably not a great fraud. <laughs> You're still gonna lose a ton of money, even though you've minimized the amount of fraud. Um, so being able to look for two things at once, or optimize for two things at once, is often valuable in production settings. And, and what this you're doing conceptually is you're trying to find the Pareto efficient frontier. So this is the set of points that are strictly dominant to all the other points um, or, or results in the configuration space. So the example here, points K and N are both strictly dominated 
by points D, E, and C. I cannot get, find a configuration that improves on both metrics relative to C. D is better on one metric, but not on the other. And likewise, B is better on one metric, but not the other. So this Pareto efficient frontier is what I'm trying to trace out and then go in and choose what's the configuration that makes the most sense for me. So, you know, when you're deploying, again, going back to the example of a real-time API that is doing um, image classification, how much of a trade-off do I want to make? You know, let's say this is accuracy and this is inference time. How much of a trade-off do I want to make on my accuracy to get a faster model? That's what this Pareto efficient frontier is going to help you try to understand. Um, so let's take a scenario. So MNIST for real time. So the, the three kind of ways you can approach this um, using most methods is, you know, you can approach it naively. You can say, I'm just going to optimize for accuracy. And then I will also evaluate how fast those models are and just pick the one that is fastest and accurate. Um, but then you can also find ways to sort of include the, 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 amount, the uh, idea of speed um, or inference time in the metric. So you can use a custom objective function. You might just say like, all right, I'm gonna just gonna take my accuracy and I'm gonna subtract the inference time from it and then just try to find like what's the arg max of those two things. Um, and then you might also try and find like some statistical method. Um, so in, in uh, cognitive psychology, there is this metric called the inverse efficiency score, which is test time or, or how fast, how long it takes you to do something divided by how well you do it. Um, so taking something like MNIST, and now I actually am gonna jump out to some code, if I can figure out how to do this, and show, to exit this, pull up this, and then zoom in. Uh, people in the back, can you, John, can you read this? All right. Um, so most of this is, is not gonna be very interesting. It's kind of the standard stuff you've seen before. Um, if you've worked with Keras or TensorFlow, so you know, load the libraries. Um, I'm going to use Hyperopt as my optimizer. I actually did not use SigOpt. Um, and then I'm going to log everything to MLflow so that I can actually go look at it and try to evaluate how, how does this trade-off happen. Um, so you know, I created different ways of recording the objective, objective metric. Naive is exactly what I said, just optimized for accuracy, but also recorded. Um, the inference time, and what I actually do is I use test time as my proxy for inference time. The faster I can evaluate my test set, the faster the model is. Um, it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Uh, I have a custom objective metric and then the inverse efficiency score. So load the data set, define the, the neural network. Um, in this case, I also added that I parameterized the, the number of layers in the model. I did not use the conditionals. I wrote this this morning, so sorry. Um, and then what you'll see is, you know, I log everything to MLflow, and here is where I sort of calculate the different objective metrics depending on which one I've chosen for the run. So I either use just sort of the naive method, just used accuracy, um, and you'll see that I negate it because uh, Hyperopt is always trying to minimize. So I'm giving it the inverse of accuracy so that it will drive it to zero. Um, if I chose custom, I just took score, the accuracy, subtracted the evaluation time, negated it. And then for inverse efficiency score, because it's already inverted, I can just calculate that directly and then pass it in. Um, and what you see when you go into MLflow is you know, I'm, I'm gonna filter it down just to the inverse efficiency scores. And what I can say now is, okay, I just wanna compare these. And I'm gonna scroll all the way to the bottom, and I'm gonna say plot test duration 
versus accuracy. So I can pretty quickly see that the configurations I'm most interested in are up here. Um, now, this does not have a real like, curve to its Pareto efficient frontier. It's more of just a, a drop off. You know, these are not very accurate, but a little bit faster. <laughs> Uh, and these are, you know, fast and, you know, just a little bit um, less, uh, less fast, slower. Um, but now I at least understand how the trade-off I'm going to make uh, in terms of accuracy versus speed. So I'm not, I'm, I can just zoom in here. These are probably my best candidates for both accurate and fast models. So these are the ones I can now take against my, my holdout set and say, okay, I'm going to go evaluate these four to see which ones actually are going to generalize the best and are fast. So instead of just you know, naively optimizing for accuracy and then hoping one of those is fast, in this case, I was able to give an objective metric that drove it to find something fast. And if I compare the different methods, let's see if I can figure out how to get back to my PowerPoint. So by comparison, I kind of see what I would expect. Um, because my custom objective function did include the, the, the concept of speed, um, it is faster. And then, you know, accuracy isn't that much better, but it is quite a bit faster. And then the statistical method, again, not much more accurate, but again, even faster. Um, so, this isn't to say that statistical methods are inherently better than a custom objective metric or even the naive approach. Um, what this is to say is that you should experiment with your objective function. And especially if you have multiple metrics that you're trying to incorporate into your decision process, you need to experiment and really figure out what is going to get you to the result that actually meets your business need. And MLflow helps a lot with that experimentation. As you saw, I was able to just go in, quickly make a plot, zoom in on the area that met my needs, and then make, use that to make choices. Some of the challenges that come with these approaches are there can be unintended consequences to custom objective functions. Um, if you have wildly varying length scales in the different metrics, then you can get a mess of a result that doesn't really change very much because you know, some large number swamps the whole thing. Um, negative values can throw off uh, your results. And in, in the case I was using where I was subtracting uh, the, the inference, the test time from accuracy, you know, pretend I was using some other metric that could have had a negative value, there would have been an unintended consequence that when it went negative, it actually would have made the thing better than when it was just a small positive number. Um, and then, of course, fractional values can also have weird unintended consequences. So you just sort of have to think about, could there be unintended consequences to the function I've created to represent my metrics? And then the challenge with statistical methods is that you ultimately have to make an a priori assumption. So with inverse efficiency score, you know, there's kind of a, a the, 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 func the function is response time divided by um, accuracy. But there's an implicit weighting on both of those values that you kind of have to pick up front. If I just do a straight division, I'm essentially saying both of these metrics mean, matter to me equally, as opposed to having like a scale, uh, some sort of scale on one or the other to articulate that no, one is actually more important to me than the other. In the case of something like an F-score, um, F-score is actually F-beta score where beta is your way of articulating what the, how you want to weight precision versus recall. Um, most people consider F-score and this use it, what they mean is F1 score, where they're basically saying precision and recall have equal weighting. That's not always the case. Um, there's an example from uh, the healthcare industry. In the, in the US, when they use models, um, there is a preference for false positives or sorry, for false negatives, because they figure they're gonna see you again in six months to a year, and so if your test comes back positive again, then okay, they know it's real. 
Um, in third world countries, they actually have a preference for false positives because they don't know if they're ever gonna see you again. So if there's any chance that there's something there, they wanna flag it immediately. So giving, in, in both of those cases, how they would express a preference for beta is fundamentally different. Um, and again, if you just used F-score arbitrarily as your objective metric, you have to make a decision up front, what is that trade-off I wanna make? Um, there is a fourth approach. Um, SIGOP supports this, again, not a pitch. Um, what they do is you actually report both values, and then they use the surrogate model and acquisition function to model the relationship between those two metrics and actually try to flush out the complete Pareto frontier, treating them independently. So using the example of precision and recall, it would actually trace out a beta-less plot of precision and recall, and then effectively you'd, each of those points on the frontier reflects a different value of beta. So just to sort of summarize some of the different libraries we've talked about and what they support, um, HP Banster, uh, Fabulous, SigOps all support early termination. Um, oh, that S is hanging off. Um, some of these libraries support conditionals. Um, we didn't talk about Spearmint or GPyopt, but these are two very popular um, Gaussian process-based Bayesian optimizers. In general, they don't really support any of these more advanced features. Um, saying supports you know, multi-metric single, yes, that's because everything except one metric. Um, and for Fabulous, I said NA for these things because, again, like I said earlier, it's not actually an optimizer. It's more a framework for um, cutting down the size of the data sets and doing what, what they call multitask uh, optimization. And then all of the libraries I talked about were open, are, are available in the open source, um, except for SigOpt, which is a commercial product. Um, if anybody wants to go back and read literature, Again, I don't know if you're getting the slides. Feel free to take a picture. But these are some of the papers um, that I talked about. This is the original Hyperband paper. Um, this is the paper that was the underlying for um, HP Banster. Um, again, that came out of uh, uh, the University of Freiburg. Um, and then this is one of many blog posts that SIGOPT has done. Um, but this one specifically talks about uh, conditional parameter spaces and the, the value of, of using them. So that's my talk with, actually I timed it perfectly, five minutes left. Thank you for coming. Um, please fill out the survey and review the session. I will now take questions. Um, and if you do have a question, please come up to the microphone in the front. And if you don't have questions, I get to go home. Hey, I was wondering when you're, com can you hear me oh, okay? Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. When you're combining the, when well, you're doing the combined uh, Bayesian and hyperband approach, um, and it's using the values of the objective function for each of the previous runs to pick the next ones to sample. Uh, does it also use how many epochs they ran for as uh, an input variable into the model? So with, um, with the Bayesian option, it actually implicitly knows that the number, the, the, so what it's actually doing is it's injecting noise into the response surface. And the more, because it knows the checkpoints ahead of time, the further along it is, the less noise it injects. So it says, essentially what it's doing is it's decreasing its uncertainty as it progresses through the checkpoints. Okay, got it, thanks. Yeah. How much do you know about the new parallel methods that are being investigated out at CMU? Uh, parallel methods have been actually in, in, the, in the literature for a long time, they're, there's, they're not new. Um, SIGOP supports parallel optimization. HyperOp supports parallel suggestion serving. Um, the trick with parallel suggestion serving is that you don't want to do synchronous because then you're just kind of waiting. Um, the challenge with asynchronous is, you know, you've, you've made your selections based on an acquisition function. You get a new result back. What do you do with the outstanding points? 
Um, and, and there's lots of different methods people use. Some is just um, do some pre-calculation, assuming you were right with what you did the first time. Um, some of them will just say, pretend that these points do terribly, then what would I do? Um, some of them choose like, to, to give like, just a noisy stochastic value and say, okay, what would happen next? Um, I, I think it's kind of an unanswered question of like, what's the right way because you're essentially trying to predict the future, which is what all these things are trying to do in the first place. Um, so parallel suggestion serving for Bayesian optimization isn't anything new, uh, but it does exist, it works. Um, the one thing I would say is that if you were gonna do 10 sequential observations, you can't just say like, well, I'll do two in parallel and five sequential. Um, you know, if you follow that to its logical extreme, you're just doing 10 in parallel and one sequential, and that's just grid search, not, or random search, not Bayesian. Um, so it's more about like reducing the wall clock. Uh, if you, like, let's say you went, you were gonna do 10 sequential and you went to two parallel, I would actually say that reduces you to having to do seven sequential. Um, so you do three fewer sequential, but you're, you're not really able to cut it in half because you still need some amount of sequence in order to actually learn. Um, hi, I, ha uh, I have some question about like a production in this uh, uh, have a friend the search. So uh, like in the company, uh, we, uh, uh, every, time, uh, like every second we get new data. So every week we will train the new model based on new data. Uh, do you think it's a best practice to uh, tune the model every time we train the, uh, train the new model? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. I now what, what, I would s what I would say is you can learn from what your previous models have done. So you can cut down the parameter space potentially. Um, so for example, something like um, the filter size on a convolutional neural network. That's probably not gonna change just because you got new data. On the other hand, the learning rate might, the dropout might, stuff like that. So I, you know, if, if, if you did a bunch of uh, tests and you saw that, hey, all of my, you know, my, my 10%, my top 10% all used Ada Delta, you could probably just decide like Ada Delta is the best optimizer for this model. That's not gonna change much. Now, th that's true assuming you have relatively stationary data. If you have non-stationary data, like you know, just pure time series, like the stock market or the weather or something like that, all bets are off. You have to treat every model training as a brand new model training. Hey, so in the last example where you're trying to optimize inference time and accuracy, mm -hmm. if you know that some of the parameters are unlikely to affect inference time, is there a way for you to specify conditionals from the parameters to one of the metrics when you're trying to find the... Yeah, it w I should have used conditionals on that example, but I just wanted to get the code done this morning because I realized it would be good to actually show something. Um, and and in, instead of trying to get the conditionals to work, I just ripped through it and just did it. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, what you could have done is gone back and said, um, or what I, what I could have showed and I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna be able to, uh, is shown like how did, you know, depending on my selection of, of um, I think it was number of full connect, NumFC, like what was the impact on test duration? And then you can start to get some intuition on like, okay, something like that that I think is gonna have an impact on inference time, does it really have an impact on inference time? Um, I actually did look at it before the talk. I gave the number of full connect layers, uh, one, two, and three. It actually made no difference. The best performance, the fastest model actually had three full connect layers. Not what you'd have expected. <laughs> I'm out of time, but I will go out there and take questions.